All right. So hello, everyone. It's Katie from the Clark Museum. And today we're going to be hearing from uh, Professor Rob Cliver from HSU. Um, this, of course, is part of our second annual Humboldt History Symposium, which is all online this year. If you enjoyed this program or any of the other programs we offer throughout the week, be sure to check out our website, clarkmuseum.org slash HHS to see what other programs are going on and how you can help support this and other Clark programs in the future. Um, so with that, we will get started. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. I'll be keeping an eye on them and we'll have some time at the end of the presentation to answer them. And I will turn it over to Rob. Go ahead. Okay, well, thank you, Katie, uh, for inviting me to this, uh, this edition of the Humboldt History Symposium. Uh, apologies to those of you who heard me give much the same talk back in February. Um, there isn't much new here. I was hoping to have the opportunity to do more research. In particular, my, my plan, hopefully I'll get to do this next year, was to travel to small cities and towns throughout Northern California to gather more materials about the Chinese residents back in the 19th century. Uh, in particular, I'm very interested in pursuing uh, any records that are in tribal archives, because what I'm finding is uh, interesting connections between the Chinese and native communities here in Northern California. Uh, but of course, I haven't been able to do that. I've hardly left the house all week, and for eight or nine months now, I've been pretty much stuck at home and haven't been anywhere. <clears throat> so um, until this situation changes, I'm not going to really have much new to say about it. Although there is one thing, there's a, a new book out that I'm going to mention. Uh, that I wrote a review of this summer uh, that I'm going to mention that if you're interested in uh, Chinese American history, especially the railroads, uh, there's a really great new book out from Stanford University Press. But let me get into today's topic, which is the Eureka Expulsion of 1885 and sort of what everybody thinks they, they know about this and why we might want to rethink some of the assumptions behind that narrative. So the story goes, and I'm sure all of you as, as local history buffs are familiar with this, uh, on February 6, 1885, beloved city council member, David Kendall, uh, was shot by uh, two Chinese heathen criminals uh, who were engaged in violent acts as they were wont to do. Uh, and uh, one of the bullets struck Ken uh, Kendall, and he uh, died shortly thereafter of his wounds. And the righteous citizens of Eureka, having long suffered uh, under the, the terrible um, presence of the Chinese in their city, uh, <clears throat> took action the only way they could. And um, without violence and without murder, um, with great restraint, uh, ordered the Chinese uh, residents of, uh, of Eureka, about 260 to 300 people, something like that, uh, to collect all of their possessions that night and be ready to go on two steamships uh, that happened to be in the harbor at the time, and that was probably a lucky thing. Uh, so the, the uh, Chinese residents of the city of Eureka were expelled by ship and sent to San Francisco, where nobody knows what happened to them. Uh, and the Council of 15 uh, sent uh, emissaries out to other parts of the county uh, where there were known to be Chinese residents and ordered them to leave as well. The Eureka model was followed all over this region and all up and down the Pacific coast. Uh, and Humboldt County remained famously uh, and proudly Chinese free for the next 60 years with the famous exception of Charlie Moon, who I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, but of course, that's all in the past. It happened a long time ago, and, and it's history, and we don't need to worry about it anymore. Uh, so as a historian, there's some interesting problems with this narrative. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the websites you'll find if you Google this topic um, is, I think it's a, a Student History Day website project. And it more or less repeats that story. Uh, the Chinese were um, smelly and diseased and heathen criminals. Uh, all, they were all drug addicts and prostitutes. 
and uh, David Kendall was was murdered sadly, and the the residents of Eureka took righteous action to to eliminate the threat in their midst, uh, this moral peril, and Humboldt County remained Chinese free for the next sixty years until after the Chinese Exclusion Act was was repealed in 1943. And I think it was in the 1950s that uh, Chinese people began to move back into Eureka. Um, and uh, even then, there was some resistance to that. So, you know, I, I have to ask some questions about this. As historians, we don't take narratives like this at face value. Were the Chinese residents of Eureka, in fact, all prostitutes and criminals deserving of expulsion? Uh, was David Kendall's murder? the reason for the February 1885 expulsion? Is there a direct cause and effect relationship there? Um, or do we need to problematize that further? Was Humboldt County in fact Chinese free? Were the Chinese driven out? Well, mostly, obviously, um, but were there more who resisted and remained besides uh, Charlie Moon? And could something like this happen again? Is it really all in the past or uh, or could uh, the, the citizens of Eureka or some other town or city in the United States be motivated once again to conduct a, a violent pogrom like this? Uh, so these are the sort of the starting points for me. And in the course of uh, researching this topic, which I've become interested in since I moved here 13 years ago uh, in 2007, uh, I found that the story is a little bit more complicated than that. And that's what I'm gonna spend the next uh, 40 minutes or so talking about. Uh, so for example, uh, just about everything we know about the Eureka expulsion comes from the perpetrators. And we have almost no testimony from inside the event, from the Chinese people. Um, and of course, uh, what, if, if we look into that and try to find that point of view, we very quickly discovered that in fact, the Chinese residents of Humboldt County were not all criminals and prostitutes and drug addicts. Most of them in fact were decent, hardworking Americans. Uh, they uh, built railroads, obviously everybody knows that. They came here to work as miners, um, did a lot of difficult jobs. Uh, they worked in, as servants and cooks throughout the region, in fact, um, one of the sources of resistance to the Chinese expulsion was uh, the white women of Humboldt County, who if you had a Chinese cook, you were loath to give him up because he was an extremely valuable asset to your family. I have managed to find some Chinese sources, not about the expulsion, but from an earlier period. Uh, these two letters uh, I found up in Trinity County in the archives of the Trinity County Historical Society. And they're not all that revealing. Um, basically, they're saying, uh, you know, it's been so long, I miss home. Thank you for taking care of my parents. It's a letter from a man home to his wife. You know, our son must be big now, I miss home. The other one was saying, the, um, the other letter says that we were working for this one labor boss, but he was a jerk, so we quit. And we found another team to work for and things are better now. Uh, Katie, in this same collection, when she did the uh, Chinese expulsion exhibit uh, back in February, uh, she used uh, another letter that was about a, a young man who'd gotten into debt uh, to a prostitute. Um, so there is that criminal element there, of course, but the Chinese are not unusual in this either. Um, there's nothing unique about their the presence of a criminal element within the Chinese community, but of course we don't use that to characterize the whole community, right? Um, most of them are, to quote Donald Trump, decent people, right? Um, so, oh yeah, so, so this is a shout out to our colleagues up in Trinity. Of course, it's a wonderful place uh, for history, uh, but in particular for the history of Chinese people in California for two reasons. One is that um, there's the Joss House there, which if you haven't had the chance to visit there, it's a fantastic site. And they've received from grant money in recent years to clean the place up and put on a new roof. And it, it looks really great now. Uh, and the interpretation there is wonderful too. Um, and one reason why Weaverville uh, and Trinity County has such a fine collection of materials on the Chinese is that unlike Humboldt, Trinity County voted to keep their Chinese population and did not have a pogrom. Um, 
And a lot of Chinese people left anyway, especially in the later part of the 20th century, just because of economic reasons mostly, but also because of the, the generally hostile environment in California in the 19th century drove a lot of people off. But Trinity was different from other parts of Northern California. And that's something that they really embrace and celebrate up there in Weaverville to this day. So the stereotype you know, is the Chinese people in Humboldt are all drug addicts and prostitutes. But we know from historical documents, uh, even uh, you know, the kinds of materials that we have in the Humboldt County Historical Society and similar collections at HSU, uh, we know that Chinese people engaged in all kinds of trades. So for example, on the left there is a vegetable peddler. That's a pretty famous photograph from the 1870s or 80s. Uh, on the right there is uh, a family photograph of the of uh, Jiao Han Yu and his family up in Crescent City, and they were merchants, shopkeepers. Uh, so these are hardworking, law-abiding people. Going back to this map of the uh, the shooting incident, which by the way doesn't even have um, uh, the guy's name right. He it calls Kendall as Kimball in one place on the map. So, you know, but anyway, what can you do? Uh, it mentions in the bottom here, Chinese gardens in hillside area, gardens in western part of the community, more gar gardens, uh, pines pasture area. Uh, and the, the photograph of the vegetable peddler there shows you that without the Chinese population, the people of Eureka might very well have begun to suffer from beriberi, scurvy, uh, and malnutrition because they, they wouldn't have had vegetables without the, the Chinese around uh, to produce this stuff for them. And there's lots of other uh, sources that point to the kinds of economic activities that Chinese people engaged in. Laundry, of course, was uh, a very uh, prominent activity for Chinese businesses. Uh, there was a laundry on F Street, the Sing Chung Company's laundry. Um, and this was a, a job that lots of Chinese men and women fell into. Um, there's also a Chinese grocery store. You can see that ad advertisement on the right there. Uh, the La Long Grocery uh, has, has taken over and they sell groceries, vegetables, candies, nuts, toys, and silk handkerchiefs, which I assume were imported from China uh, in this era and not from New Jersey, which was America's main silk center. Uh, and that uh, document up top there, the photograph from 2017, uh, is a photo I took uh, from uh, a document in the Humboldt County Historical Society and it shows, it shows records of businesses paying their business licenses to legally operate in the city. And you can see there in, in 1883, the Kong Hop Company in Eureka uh, is, has paid its dues, uh, its fees for, for business licenses and so forth regularly. So far from being wantonly violent, corrupt criminals, uh, Chinese people were law-abiding citizens who worked hard and ran legal businesses of all kinds. Thus, and this belies a lot of the claims of the newspapers of the era that claim that the uh, Chinese are parasites, that they don't contribute anything but immorality to the community. On the contrary, they're making significant uh, contributions to the economic and physical health of the people of Eureka. So in, if that's the case then, if the Chinese were not simply violent criminals who deserve to be expelled, man, woman, and child, um, then what caused the expulsion? What's the background and, and context of this? Well, Chinese immigration to the United States in that era was part of a global wave of immigration to the United States beginning in the 1850s and 60s. Of course, the, the gold rush was a big part of that. Uh, but there was more to it besides. Uh, and there was both the, the economic pull of opportunities, especially in California, but also, and the, the case with the Irish is quite similar. There's a, a push from the home country. Uh, in Ireland, it's the potato blight and massive famine and devastation resulting from that by the 1880s. Uh, and in China, in the 1860s, there's a massive civil war called the Taiping Rebellion, and something like 15 million people were probably killed during a 15-year period. And lots of people uh, fled that situation and fled the subsequent repression uh, and persecution of the Taipings uh, by coming to California. 
But once they got here, fr right from the beginning, there was racist prejudice against Chinese people, as well as ever mounting legislation that enabled that discrimination, along with political rhetoric. And, and you're all familiar with this because you live in 21st century America. Uh, after the railroads were completed in the 1860s, uh, the long depression of the 1870s really aggravated anti-Chinese sentiment. Uh, and the labor movement was particularly virulent in its anti-Chinese sentiments and actions, uh, including uh, mob violence against Chinese communities in Washington, Oregon, and California. So this timeline kind of shows you uh, some of the main events of this early history. Uh, and I've highlighted examples of racist anti-Chinese legislation, like the foreign miners tax uh, was mainly aimed at people who could be identified on the basis of skin color as not being Anglo-Americans. Uh, and they were charged $20 a month for the right to work their claims. And that right wasn't even uh, supported legally. Uh, oftentimes, Chinese miners were forced off of their claims by white miners, and the government wouldn't do anything about it, despite the fact that they had paid this discriminatory tax. Um, similarly, in 1854, the California Supreme Court, in the case of People versus Hall, which I believe was a murder trial, uh, ruled that uh, Chinese people could not testify in court legally. Uh, and it included this statement, quote, the same rule which would admit them to testify would admit them to all the equal rights of citizenship. And we might soon see them at the polls, in the jury box, upon the bench, and in our legislative halls. Um, and uh, just incidentally, convicted murderer George Hall was set free because Chinese people were not allowed to, to testify against him. And there's other restrictions and prohibitions on immigration and on the, the livelihoods that Chinese people could pursue. There's law barring, uh, barring uh, marriage between so-called whites and Chinese. Um, and by getting specifically into Humboldt County, by 1875, Chinese people had begun to come to this part of California uh, at first to work on the railroad projects around here. Um, and uh, at the same time, there's legislation prohibiting um, Chinese, Japanese, and so-called Mongolian, and that's a, a racist term to apply to all East Asians, uh, preventing prostitutes, felons, and contract laborers from immigrating. Uh, and that's an early kind of version of the 1882 uh, Federal Chinese Exclusion Act. So there's widespread anti-Chinese sentiment and action in California. And it's produced by a, a mixture of uh, racism, uh, hatred for, for cultural difference and the other, uh, but also uh, economic competition. And as I said, the labor movement was particularly virulent in its uh, harassment and persecution of Chinese people, including numerous riots, uh, famously in San Francisco, but dozens of incidents up and down the Pacific coast, uh, places like Truckee, um, Tacoma, Washington, where Chinese communities were set upon uh, by uh, angry white Americans. Uh, and the local police often did little to nothing to protect the Chinese communities from violence, uh, despite the fact that all of this is illegal. And it's an interesting example of how, regardless of what the law says, if the police and the courts are not going to uh, prosecute people for committing crimes against Chinese people, then the law doesn't matter. The law is not protecting these individuals and communities. Uh, so uh, here's some other examples of those uh, riots and uh, massacres, such as the one in San Francisco's Chinatown in October 1971, and then again in 1877, uh, and agitation to uh, keep the Chinese out uh, and to restrict the immigration of more Chinese people to California culminated in uh, the passage of federal law, the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which temporarily suspended immigration of unskilled Chinese laborers for 10 years. It was later extended and the law continued in effect until it was repealed in 1943 when China and the United States were allies uh, against Japan in World War II. Uh, 
So there was debate leading up to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, to a lot of Americans, this seemed unfair. Uh, after all, there's hooligans and criminals among all races. Why are we singling out the Chinese? Lots of people knew from personal experience that Chinese people were generally honest, law-abiding, and hardworking, uh, and that they wanted to have their families and their communities just like any other folks. So these are two uh, cartoons uh, from the Atlantic Monthly, which was a, a fairly liberal or left-leaning um, uh, a kind of uh, publication back in the day. And that term liberal is kind of interesting. Of course, it means something different to people in politics today. Uh, but um, of course, it, it also has connotations of the free market and capitalism, that the liberals are the ones that want you know, opportunity for capital and labor to pursue happiness and so forth. Um, and that's often the accusation was that the Chinese were tools of capital. Uh, so the working men's associations and the unions were particularly hostile to Chinese who they saw as uh, working for low wages in terrible conditions that white Christian men wouldn't put up with. Um, they were also used as strike breakers, which made the unions kind of hostile to them. Um, but uh, by the same token, um, you know, the, the capitalists are benefiting from this influx of cheap labor. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, they're pretending to be friends of the Chinese and to pretending to be open-minded and anti-racist. But in fact, what they're really uh, out for is, is cheap labor. And that's the accusation hurled at the other side. Uh, for their part, the, the Chinese leaders, and at this point, China is the, the Manchu Qing Empire or Qing Dynasty, um, they have government officials in the United States who are here to look out for the interests of their people. Uh, and this photograph shows the representatives of the so-called six companies, um, or Tong. Uh, the Tong are often thought to be criminal gangs in discussions of this, but they're more like companies, really. They're really business ventures. Uh, so they do facilitate immigration of their people uh, into the United States and give them employment opportunities. And this kind of activity continues to this day. Um, when people immigrate to this country from China, they're often participating in an established network that will help them to get set up with a restaurant someplace or something like that. Uh, in any case, the memorial of the six companies to US Congress in December 1877 was agitating against uh, the kind of law that they passed in 1882 and making the case for uh, the Chinese as being decent, law-abiding, hardworking citizens of the United States, um, that making the argument that the Chinese are not the problem here. In fact, we're being slandered by the Irish and the Irish are the ones that are the problem. And it's really interesting to see that come out in these documents, how um, the American elites are successfully turning one group of immigrants against another. Uh, and this is a theme that's re repeatedly brought up on both sides of this debate over immigration is, um, you know, well, if we're treating the Irish this way, why are we treating the, the Chinese different? And other people saying the Irish and the Chinese are all the same. We need to get rid of them all. They're all terrible people. Um, so uh, and here the, the Chinese are ready to throw their fellow Irish workers under the bus. Um, and so with the, with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act in uh, 1882, there, there's a complete reversal of the earlier treaty between the two countries. The, the Berlin Game Treaty of 1868 provided for fair and equitable immigration between the two countries. And it's a remarkably equal treaty in which uh, Americans have the right to go to China and set up businesses and Chinese people have the right to go to America and set up businesses or look for work and so forth. And you see the advertisement on the right there, uh, it, the um, Uncle Sam there uh, is booting out the Chinese. Uh, and this is very much part of the Chinese Exclusion Act movement. Um, but the pretext is that uh, this company has produced an, an automatic washing machine, which means we no longer need the Chinese. The only reason they're here is to do the laundry we have machines for that now, we can get rid of the Chinese. And I, I think I don't need to stress the racist implications of this advertisement. Uh, so for a lot of people in California, 
exclusion and preventing more Chinese people from coming to California didn't go far enough. What they wanted was expulsion or extermination if that, uh, that wasn't possible. And so increasingly in the 1880s, from 82 uh, to 85, there's increasing agitation uh, for Chinese expulsion to, to get rid of these people, not to simply prevent more fr from coming. Uh, and so the, the events in Eureka in 1885 are sort of the culmination of decades of violence and prejudice against Chinese people in California. Uh, so my point here is not that uh, my point here is that the, the assassination or accidental murder of David Kendall uh, was not the cause for the expulsion. The cause for the expulsion of the Chinese residents was anti-Chinese racism. The, the Kendall's death was simply a pretext. Uh, and let me show you what I mean. Uh, there's tremendous evidence of anti-Chinese sentiment in Eureka from the newspapers. Uh, here's an example from the Humboldt Times in February 1883. I assume that this was in response to a uh, spring festival or Chinese New Year celebration. And they say uh, no another noisy Chinese display, great mass of firecrackers, powerful bombs, uh, woke the echoes from Prairie, uh, Prairie Edition to Fairhaven. Um, and the usual confusion of tongues, gibberish, and gyrations all help towards appealing the Mongolian joss, we suppose. And that comment, too, shows that not only are these, the, the, is the writer finding this uh, culturally unfamiliar festival offensive, he doesn't want to know what it's about. He doesn't care. Um, and then all quiet on the China coast when the Vesper bell struck, for which mercy the usual blandy and opium potations may be thanked. Um, and just to point out there, uh, you know, obviously they're mocking a Chinese accent with the blandy comment. And the assumption is that not that the Chinese have finished their festivities, but that they're all too drunk or stoned to, to do it anymore. But it also misses the point that um, Americans and Europeans were taking opium in alcohol in the form of laudanum. Uh, and that practice was quite widespread in the United States in the late 19th century. Uh, so this was not something unique to the Chinese. Um, but of course, our, our author here doesn't mention that. His purpose is to slander and vilify our Chinese neighbors. And I've got some other examples here of uh, reports of crimes against uh, Chinese individuals. Um, and I won't go into the details on this one, except that I found uh, a great many of these kinds of articles that mention uh, the body of a Chinese man was found murdered on the road, his pockets turned out. Um, who could have done this? Probably uh, an Indian or another Chinese person, more than likely. But the, obviously the likely uh, suspect would be a white man, almost certainly. Um, and the attitude is, is generally that, well, nobody cares if Chinese people die. Um, even Chinese people don't care. They're not coming forward with any information or anything. On the right is an interesting editorial that basically says, um, we shouldn't treat Chinese people badly. Some Chinese men uh, arrived on a ship and a crowd of boys and men gathered about and uh, took delight in pushing and jostling them, knocking their goods and chattels about. Um, and the, the author says such conduct is, is not becoming of gentlemen. We shouldn't treat our Chinese friends like this. Uh, and so this is an interesting counterexample. Uh, and it shows that the editorial stance in Humboldt newspapers was not consistent. Uh, but generally, the trend was toward anti-Chinese sentiment um, and uh, basically treating violent crimes against Chinese people uh, as nothing much to worry about because uh, it's not happening to us. Uh, we don't really care. And the article on the left there ends with the statement, a live Chinaman don't take much interest in a dead one unless he killed it. So typical of the sentiments of the newspapers in Eureka in the 1880s. And this one is particularly special. Uh, and uh, the phrase wipe out the plague spots, which is the title of this editorial, note the publication date of 5 February 1885, just the day before David Kendall uh, 
uh, was so tragically killed. Uh, and I've highlighted a couple of quotes here. Uh, for example, the statement, the time has come when these plague spots should be removed. They are no benefit to the city. On the contrary, are a withering curse upon our real interests. And then finally, the statement, this leper's colony is a curse to the city and its future prosperity. Knowing this, is it not time for good citizens to act with one united voice? And basically what they're calling for is the removal of the Chinese people from Eureka uh, by any means necessary on any pretext. And the next day, bang, they got their pretext. Uh, it, it's almost, you know, if I was conspiracy minded, I would have thought maybe uh, Kendall was purposefully murdered just to facilitate such action. But I, I think it was just a happenstance. I think it was an accident um, that these people seized upon to motivate uh, the folks in town. Um, and, you know, the, I won't go into the events of February 7th and 8th and the specific expulsion in great detail, except to mention uh, the weather had something to do with it. Uh, there was a great many, uh, the weather was rough uh, and rainy, and there was a great many of the lumber workers and miners and elements like that in town with nothing to do. And this proved to be very exciting for them. So a big mob assembled very quickly. Uh, and the authorities were barely able to keep the lid on violence. Uh, in fact, um, they set up a gallows and one uh, minister who attempted to intervene uh, was hanged in effigy. Uh, so there was certainly the threat of violence, if not um, any actual lynchings. Uh, and the other thing that was perhaps fortunate is that because of the bad weather, two steamers were in port at the time. And so they had the, ca the capability of removing the Chinese population. And if that hadn't happened, uh, you know, if they hadn't been able to get out in a couple of days, things might have gotten much worse in terms of violence. In any case, this is essentially a violent act. I mean, with the threat of violence, people were uh, dispossessed of their belongings, kicked out of their homes, uh, and uh, had to abandon their businesses, uh, their property, and so forth. This uh, Eureka model then uh, was imitated up and down the coast uh, over the next year or two. Uh, cities of Arcata, Ferndale, and Crescent City uh, took similar actions. Um, ultimately, uh, the Exclusion Act's legality was upheld, uh, and even further indignities were heaped on Chinese Americans. For example, the Geary Act in 1892 uh, required Chinese residents to carry permits. And this was only spottily enforced, um, particularly in Southern California, where there was a massive movement of civil disobedience to resist the so-called dog tag law. And Chinese people just refused to wear them, um, which that didn't necessarily protect them from abuse. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, of course, there was the uh, birthright citizenship was protected. If you're born in this country, you can become a citizen regardless of race or nationality. But even today, some people uh, don't like that rule at all, particularly if it applies to non-white people. Um, so uh, obviously uh, the Chinese people weren't gonna take this sitting down. And um, even if there wasn't violent resistance at the time, uh, there were other forms of resistance. And this is sort of the next point I wanna make uh, is that, in this story, where we don't hear Chinese voices very much, the Chinese are presented as kind of hapless victims. And that once they were expelled, it was all over until 1906 when some Chinese uh, cannery workers came from Seattle and they were expelled too. Um, but it's not problematized, you know? And, and one of the first steps in doing that is to look at the lawsuit uh, that the uh, 57 different uh, individuals and companies who were expelled from Eureka in 1885 brought a lawsuit against the city of Eureka. And this lawsuit never went anywhere. Uh, I think it was tossed out of court. Uh, but it's, So it didn't really have any consequences, but it's an interesting historical document. And I'm going to read from it here. Um, and this is uh, partway down, starting at line 16. 
uh, and this is just one of many. So his rebuttal is what I have here on the right. Uh, and those are also form letters that the, the lawyers filled out. Uh, and this one states that, uh, and they categorically de deny everything in category by category. Uh, and in line 16, they say the defendant denies that on said last mentioned day or at any other time, the said or any rioters acting together or otherwise riotously or at all broke into or in any manner went into or upon or any said promises of said Tai Kim in this case, um, you know, fill in the blank or carried away or destroyed any of his goods or merchandise or furniture or fixtures or clothing or personal effects or money or provisions. And then the part at the end there from line 24 to 27 is crossed out because they couldn't get away with it in court. It's categorically untrue. Uh, it says, uh, or drove him or his family or any member thereof uh, from there or any dwelling or uh, from said city or, or caused them to be removed beyond uh, the corporate limits thereof. And the city of Eureka couldn't claim that that was untrue because they'd been crowing about it for months in the press about how they had just removed all the Chinese from the city of Eureka and how proud they were. So it was impossible for, to, for them to deny that. Uh, and so they had to cross that out of their uh, rebuttal to the Chinese lawsuit. Well, as I said, that didn't really go anywhere. Um, and interestingly, despite how famous Eureka became uh, at the time, you know, in the 1880s, uh, Chinese people all over the Pacific coast and even in China had heard of Eureka and, and knew you don't wanna go to Eureka. They don't, they don't like you there. Uh, and by the same token, Chinese people didn't like Eurekans. Uh, I've read a number of stories reported in the local press over the years about how Chinese people refuse to serve people from Eureka and other parts of the state. But interestingly, despite this, there's not very much about this in Chinese American histories. Uh, the Eureka expulsion is rarely mentioned. Uh, what I've shown you here is two contrary examples. Uh, Jean Falzer only discovered the Eureka uh, expulsion, kind of like me. Uh, I'd never heard of this before I moved here. She came to work at HSU for a time. She's a writer discovered this incident and researched and wrote this book called Driven Out, which is quite good and focuses on the Eureka expulsion uh, as kind of the model uh, and motivation for lots of similar examples. Another one that's a little more conspiracy theorist uh, is Scott Zagoria's book on the right there, The Chinese Question and the Eureka Solution. Um, that's a much slimmer volume and, and not as well researched, but it does focus on the Eureka expulsion. Interestingly, the, the book I mentioned at the start of my talk, uh, this new book from Stanford uh, called The Chinese and the Iron Road, uh, which is wonderful, it's 23 chapters, uh, all exploring and kind of pushing the boundaries of what we know about this group of men and what can we learn about them by being creative with sources and using archeology. span They even use DNA from goji berries. Uh, to show the talk about the material lives of these Chinese workers. They don't even mention the Eureka expulsion in this book. It doesn't even come up in the introduction or anywhere. They mention Truckee, uh, which is more germane to their topic. But um, you know, one of the chapters is on where did these men go after 1865 and the, uh, um, you know, the, the completion of the Trans-Pacific Railroad, Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, and a lot of them came here to Humboldt County to work on railroads in this region. The book doesn't even mention that. So it's an otherwise wonderful book, especially if you are interested in, in this, this specific topic of the lives of Chinese railroad workers, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, but that's one thing that the book does not mention is the Eureka expulsion. Uh, so maybe it's time to remind America about this event that happened uh, so many years ago. So, um, Back to my, uh, my questions about the incident here. Uh, this is uh, the front page of an 1890 uh, business directory of Humboldt County put out by the Chamber of Commerce. And you can see there that along with describing the climate, scenery, beautiful homes and so forth, it mentions this is the only county in the state containing no Chinaman. Um, 
And of course, that wasn't true. <laughs> Uh, but it was an interesting claim. Uh, it might have been true to say that there were no Chinese people residing in the city of Eureka, but there were in Humboldt County and, and in the surrounding counties as well of Del Norte, Trinity, Mendocino. Uh, and in fact, the more I look for them, the more I find them. So they might say, well, Charlie Moon is the exception that proves the rule, which I've always found that to be a stupid saying. Exceptions don't prove rules. Exceptions should lead us to doubt the rule and come up with a new rule, like Chinese people resisted expulsion. And Charlie Moon was just one example of that. Uh, another was Willie Bo. And there's that guy Fong uh, as well. And it turns out that once you start looking for them, there's numerous stories about men who fled Eureka but remained in the area. And a great many of them uh, intermarried with Native American women. Charlie Moon married a Hoopa woman uh, and his descendants are still very active in the Hoopa tribal community to this day. Um, there's other documents. Uh, for example, this one, uh, it was published in uh, 1963. Uh, and this woman re uh, remembers her grandfather telling her about uh, a Chinese man who swam the length of Humboldt Bay to Booner Point, crossed the marshes, and came to the ranch on Humboldt Hill, hid out in grandfather's barn, and remained there and did cho chores on the ranch. Um, I've got another similar kind of excerpt from a letter from uh, Brenda Harmon uh, Katnich to Wally Lee in which she mentions how, um, I think it was her grandfather, Reverend Katnich, who was a teacher, would go up to teach on the Klamath River and he knew of three Chinese families up there, uh, Willie Bo and his family, the guy named Fong and another man named John Cook. And they had all married, uh, I think, Yurok and Hoopa women. Uh, and so this has become a, a topic of especially important interest to me and, uh, I, I have been unable to pursue it to, so far, uh, but it seems like there's potentially a great many uh, Charlie Moons out there uh, who assimilated into native communities. Interestingly, in the Chinese and the Iron Road book, there's a whole chapter about this, about how uh, on the railroad routes for the Trans-Pacific Railway out in California and Utah, um, there were a lot of affinities between Chinese railroad workers and the native peoples in those regions. And Chinese people introduced cabbage. What you call Napa cabbage is bai cai. It's a staple Chinese vegetable. Um, and uh, so they shared cuisine, uh, they intermarried. Uh, and there's a lot of connections there that are only recorded in tribal archives and tribal histories. Uh, so I'm interested to look more at, at those kind of sources here in Northern California uh, to see what we can find. Just one more example of that, I, I found this article from the Daily Humboldt Times in November 1897, uh, and it mentions how this guy Asak showed up in Eureka, claimed protection as the last of his race in Humboldt County, which almost certainly wasn't true. Um, and uh, it re the, the article reminds readers of the 1885 expulsion, which we're still so proud of. Uh, and he's saying, and again, you know, they imitate the Chinese accent and everything. And uh, he's going back to San Francisco because uh, he's an old man and he wants to, to head home and go back to his family. Um, so things haven't uh, changed much in the tone and attitude by 1897. But one thing this does indicate is that this guy was still around 12 years later uh, and nobody knew about him until he showed up in Eureka looking for a ferry passage to San Francisco. So how many other Asaks were there who simply died unknown and forgotten uh, and were buried along with their names? Uh, just one more example of what I'm talking about. And, and you see, into the 1880s, 1890s, in the maps of lumber camps and other records of the lumber industry, that there's China camps. Uh, and the implication is that there are Chinese workers who probably did a lot of, of uh, the cooking in lumber camps in Mendocino and Humboldt. And they're still there after expulsion. 
Uh, and we see Chinese railroad crews as well uh, being brought in. And this is not unproblematic until 1906, until that event, which got photographed and, and played up in the press a lot. But this is a, a photograph from uh, 1896, from uh, when Pacific Lumber Company had just established the largest lumber mill in the, in the world, uh, if not the country. And in the back row, uh, third from the left there, is a man who looks distinctly Chinese to me. Um, this guy may very well be a Chinese mill worker or perhaps the descendant of a Chinese man and a Wiat uh, or Hupa or Yurok woman. Uh, who knows? I, I think this is a, a question that bears uh, much greater investigation and research. Uh, so just to, to finish off here, um, by uh, 1943, China and the, the United States had been allies during the, the Second World War. Um, and uh, racism had temporarily become unpopular in America because of the war with the Nazis. Racism and eugenics had been, been given a bad name by the Nazis. And the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed. Uh, and replaced by the Magnuson Act that set the immigration quotas and the lottery system that we're familiar with developed after that. Uh, and it only allowed 105 Chinese to immigrate to the US each year. Um, and interestingly, uh, at that point also, the US Army drafted more than 20% of Chinese men living in the United States into the Army, um, including uh, Ben Chin, who was one of the first Chinese people to move back into Eureka in the 1950s. Uh, ben Chin had, been, had served in the US military in Europe and was a, an MP and served with distinction. So, uh, you know, like Japanese people, Chinese people have had to prove themselves, uh, have, been able, have been forced to prove themselves uh, as, as Americans. And the way I see it, you know, answering the question of why were there so many Chinese people here and in Mendocino County and elsewhere in Northern California, even after the Eureka expulsion and similar acts, why did they stay here? The reason is because they're Americans and this is their home. Uh, this is where they made their lives uh, just like the rest of us uh, and they deserve to be treated as Americans. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, well, there's lots of other things that we could talk about on that, but I wanna come around to my last question of, is this really all in the past and could never happen again? Well, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I can certainly imagine uh, armed men in trucks waving flags surrounding a certain community in our, in our county um, and saying, if you people don't go out, if you don't get out, we'll, uh, you know, we'll have to resort to violence. Um, and I wonder you know, what the police would do in that situation. What would ICE do? Um, are we returning to a similar point in history uh, as we saw 135 years ago with the Eureka expulsion? Um, how close are we to something like this happening again? So uh, that's it for me. I'm done with my presentation there. I hope I didn't take too very long. Oh, no. Um, I hope I didn't talk too fast either. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions you have. I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, recognizing that I am still new to this topic and really only just beginning my research. All right. Well, thanks, Rob. So we've had one comment so far, and I think you did mention this probably right after she posted uh, this statement, but it should be stated that the Chinese were not allowed to marry whites. There was a law preventing them, and this law was not removed until 1952 which I think you yeah. mentioned like right after she posted it, so. Yeah, I did not know that it had later been repealed in 1952. I, I hadn't realized that. Um, I think it was first passed in 1877 or something like that. So it's a real early law. Um, and, and it's typical throughout the United States, miscegenation or miscegenation laws um, to prevent people from mixing races. Uh, and in fact, there's a really interesting article about exactly this topic that uh, is kind of shocking. It involves the uh, marriage of an older Chinese, actually two marriages of older Chinese men to uh, young white women, teenagers, really, um, and, and kind of shows how economic and intimate relationships intertwine. Uh, 
Um, but if you're interested, you can contact me and I'll, I'll dig that up for you. And then we have uh, from someone with California State Park says, thanks for this. And then one of uh, our museum members, Gail, also says thank you for the presentation. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. If you know, it's it's hard if it's just me and Katie talking. It's you know, she's heard all this before, so <laughs> I'm glad there's other interested parties. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so, just I was you know taking some notes. Um, so when you were doing some research, um, did you come across the name Dennis Kearney? He was a labor leader, who. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Dennis Kearney. Uh, I, there's a book, uh, Working People of California, and I think he shows up in that. Okay. Uh, why? Yeah. What can you tell me about him? There was a thing I was seeing where he came out to Eureka, and I'm not sure that he participated, but he was definitely around when the expulsion happened in 1885. And it was said that he was one of the people that went to some of the other major expulsion events that happened and was kind of touting this Eureka plan kind of thing. Um, oh, okay. So he's kind of an outside agitator. Yeah, I'm not sure if he was participating, but he was around. So uh -huh. he was taking notes, possibly. Well, I'll have to chase that down. Yeah. Um, I'll Google it. Yeah, and I was trying to find more information on him um, and it's in my notes somewhere, but um, yeah. Uh, let's see. So if anyone else has other questions, feel free to put them in the comments here. I'll be keeping an eye on those. Um, so another thing I remember coming up was um, that there were railroad companies that would go to China specifically to recruit workers for the railroads. Um, do you know if there were any like local railroads that did that kind of thing or were they mostly just pulling from the um transcontinental railroad i i don't think local companies did that um there was by the 1770s uh, sorry 1870s when the railroads around here were being built um there were plenty of chinese workers uh and, and a lot of them had been laid off uh so there was uh, lots of free labor around um, but the um, Trans-Pacific Railroad Company, owned by uh, Stanford, who was also governor of the state and an investor in the railroad, you know, it's, yeah. well, we're used to that now, right? The government's <laughs> just in cahoots with business. Um, they very actively recruited in South China, mainly. And um, in fact, that's one of the big themes in that book, The Chinese and the Iron Road, is sort of looking outside of America at more global tran uh, international uh, networks of migration and supplies too, like Chinese workers on the railroad got their vinegar and their soy sauce and their, their wine and so forth from back home. So there's commercial networks that supported the labor immigration as well. And there's ties to South America and the Caribbean and Canada as well. These people went all over. Sometimes they went back too. There's one chapter that's based on uh, songs and epigraphs of tombstones okay. um, of railroad workers whose bodies were sent home. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. That's actually one place where we get Chinese sources is from the Chinese side. Uh, and there's been kind of a renewed interest in this topic among Chinese historians. Um, which wasn't the case during the Mao era and into the late 20th century, but now there is. Um, and interestingly, the, the scholar who wrote the article about Chinese railroad workers and Native Americans is from Taiwan. Oh. So there's, there's all kinds of connections going on. It's very interesting, but I've only started scratching the surface. Yeah, I remember reading something, um, I think it was right around when the you know, 150th anniversary of the Transcontinental Railroad was happening, there were some people doing some research where they were trying to build those bridges between Chinese institutions that have information, you know, from letters being sent back and American institutions trying to figure out where 
you know, people were going after they, you know, left California or, you know, left Oregon or whatnot and might have gone back to China. Yeah. And so this book has the, the money and power and, and authority of Stanford University behind it. Um, and the project is based there. And the editors are the project directors. So, uh, yeah, and it's been a very transnational effort. Uh, in fact, there's one chapter on European journalists reporting on the railroad and kind of their, how, what the significance of the railroad and these Chinese workers was for them. You mentioned the 150th anniversary. One thing I learned from the introduction to this book is that at the 100th anniversary, which was in uh, 1966, I guess, or 65, the um, Secretary of Transportation was there. Yeah. And he's talking about this great achievement that Americans did and only Americans could have, you know, done these tunnels and built it so quickly. And the Chinese heritage people are there and like, you mean Chinese Americans, right? And he made no mention of the fact that these workers were Chinese, that they were discriminated against and despised. Um, and it just got glossed over or literally whitewashed. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one thing that this book is trying to overcome is to bring that back. But it does so much more than that. You know, we know that Chinese workers built the railroads, but what else about them? Um, so it's a very rich book. And if, if anyone's interested in the topic, you should, you should get, I'll lend it to you, Katie. You'd, you'd okay. like <laughs> I was going to say, it's been on my reading list for a while. And yeah, cool. Well, it's great to hear your glowing review of it. Um, and it looks like we're just about out of time for today. So thanks for uh, hosting this uh, presentation. Um, for my all pleasure. The for all the people that are watching, uh, of course, we'll have other presentations throughout the week as well. Uh, Clarkmuseum.org slash HHS has our full schedule. Um, and you can also find more information on there um, about how to help support this event and future events hosted by us and um, other history organizations. So thanks, Rob. And we'll see everyone around at our next presentations throughout the week. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, yeah. everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.